Political Law, Powers and Structures of Government, Part 1, Preliminary Concepts, Nature of a Constitution. So, Constitution, the term Constitution is a body of rules and maxims in accordance with which the powers of sovereignty are habitually exercised. Then, the parts of the Constitution, parts of the 1987 Constitution are... Article 1, the National Territory. Article 2, the Declaration of Principles and State Policies. Article 3, Bill of Rights. Article 4, Civil Citizenship. Article 5, Suffrage. Article 6, Legislative Department. Article 7, Executive Department. Article 8, Judicial Department. Article 9, Constitutional Commissions. Article 10, the Local Government. Article 11, Accountability of Public Officers. Article 12, the National Economy and Patrimony. Article 8, oh, Article 13, Social Justice and Human Rights. Article 14, Education, Science and Technology, Arts, Culture and Sports. Article 15, the Family. Article 16, General Provisions. Article 17, Amendments or Revisions. Article 18, Transitory Provisions. So the 1987 Constitution is composed of the preamble and these 18 articles. What are the essential parts of a good written Constitution? The essential parts of a good written constitution are Constitution of Liberty, number two, Constitution of Sovereignty, number three, Constitution of Government. What does the Constitution of Liv Liberty contain? So, the Constitution of Liberty contains the fundamental civil and political rights of the citizens as well as the limitations on the powers of the government to secure the enjoyment of the rights of the citizens. These are Article 3, 4, 5, and 12 of the 1987 Constitution. Number 2. What is the Constitution of Sovereignty? So, the Constitution of Sovereignty contains the provisions on how changes in the Constitution is to be made. Example is Article 17. Then, what is the constitution of government the constitution of government enumerates the powers of government and outlines its organization so the constitution of government enumerates the powers of the government and outlines its organizations manner of interpretation under the nature of constitution is the manner of interpretation. So, it could either be self-executing and non-executing character. So, question, what are self-executing provisions of the constitution? Self-executing provisions are immediately effective without the need of legislation. Those in which the nature and extent of the right conferred and the liability imposed are fixed by the constitution itself in case of doubt the constitution should be considered self-executing provisions under the bill of rights example of this self-executing provisions are provisions under the bill of rights article 2 section 16 of the 1987 constitution on the right to a balanced and healthful ecology under the case of Oposa, Oposa versus Factoran, July 13, 1993. Oposa versus Factoran, e O P O S A versus Factoran. Question What are non self executing provisions of the Constitution? The non self executing provisions lay down a general principle and merely indicate the principles without laying down rules giving them the force of law. The disregard of such provisions does not give rise to any cause of action before the courts. Pamatong versus Comilek. So, kining 
itong self non itong non self executing provisions they lay down a general principle and merely indicate the principles without laying down rules giving them the force of law so they don't have the force of law because it merely indicates the principles disregard of such provisions does not give rise to any cause of action before the courts pamatong versus factoran so kahit na i disregard ang ang um, provision na ito it will not Uh, give rise to any cause of action before the courts. The next concept is the process of change, which is amendments and revisions. Question. Distinguish amendment from revision. Amendment broadly refers to a change that adds reduces or deletes without altering the basic principle involved and generally affects only the specific provision being amended. On the other hand, itong revision, this broadly implies a change that alters a basic principle in the Constitution. Example, altering the principle of separation of powers or the substantial entirety of the Constitution as when the change affects substantial provisions of the Constitution. Lambino v. Comilic, October 25, 2006. So again, itong amendment, it broadly refers to a change that adds, reduces, or deletes without altering the basic principle involved and generally affects only the specific provision being amended. Whereas itong revision, It broadly implies a change that alters a basic principle in the Constitution. So, kung amendment, um, hindi ina, uh, the basic the basic principle involved is not altered. While dito sa revision, ang basic principle in the Constitution is altered. Question, what are the steps involved in the amendatory or revision process? Answer, The amendatory, the amendatory or revision process involves number one, proposal, and number two, ratification. Question, how can a proposal under the Constitution be made? Proposal may be made by number one, the Congress acting as a constituent assembly by a vote of three-fourths of all its members voting separately. This is Article 13. Section 1, Paragraph 1 of the Constitution. Number 2. The Constitutional Convention, called either by two-thirds of all the members of Congress or by majority of all the members of Congress, with the question of whether to call for a Constitutional Convention to be resolved by the people in a plebiscite. So, second, number 2 is Constitutional Convention. So, proposal may be made through a constitutional convention called either by two-thirds of all the members of Congress or by majority of all the members of Congress with the question of whether to call a constitutional convention to be resolved by the people in a plebiscite. So, itong constitutional convention can be done in two ways. Either, one, two-thirds of all the members of Congress or two, by majority of all the members of Congress with the question of whether to call for a constitutional convention to be resolved by the people in a plebiscite. This is Article 12, Section 3 of the Constitution. Number three, People's Initiative. Through a petition of at least 12% of the total number of voters of which every legislative district must be represented by at least 3% of the registered voters therein. The last mode may not be used within five years following the ratification of the 1987 Constitution, nor more often than once every five years thereafter. So the third way of um, proposal, the third way of proposal, Proposal to amend the 
constitution to amend or revise the constitution is people's initiative this is through a this is done through a petition of at least 12 percent of the total number of voters of which every legislative district must be represented by at least three percent of the registered voters therein how is ratification made so the next step the next step of amending or revising the uh, constitution is ratification how is ratification made question how is a ratification made answer Proposed amendments shall be submitted to the people and shall be deemed ratified by the majority of the votes cast in a plebiscite held not earlier than 60 days nor later than 90 days. So after approval of the proposal by Congress or Constitutional Convention or number two, after certification by the COMELEC of the sufficiency of petition of the people. Ratification of constitution may be held simultaneously with general or regular elections. Gonzalez versus Comilex. So, ratification. How is ratification made? Proposed amendments shall be submitted to the people and shall be deemed ratified by the majority of the votes cast in a plebiscite held not earlier than 60 days nor later than 90 days. After the approval of the proposed Congress or Constitutional Convention or after certification by the Comelec of the sufficiency of petition of the people. Question. What are the modes of revising the Constitution? The modes of revision are, number one, by the Congress upon a vote of three-fourths of all its members, or number two, by a constitutional convention so to revise the constitution the modes of revising a constitution are number one by the congress upon a vote of three-fourths of all its members or number two by a constitutional convention this is article 12 section 1 is people's initiative a mode of revising the constitution Question, is people's initiative a mode of revising the constitution? No. Answer, no. People's initiative can only be exercised to propose amendments to the constitution. A revision of a constitution affects basic principles or several provisions of a constitution. Thus, a deliberate body with, body with recorded proceedings is best suited to undertake a revision. Lambino versus Comilec, October 25, 2006. So, no, people's initiative can only be exercised to propose amendments to the Constitution. A revision of a Constitution affects basic principles or several provisions of a Constitution. Thus, a deliberative body with recorded proceedings is best suited to undergo, to undertake a revision. Question. To determine whether a proposed amendment is within the power of the people to directly propose through initiative, what are the tests applied? So the two-part test which must be satisfied by a people's initiative are number one, quantitative test. It asks whether the proposed change is so extensive in its provision as to change directly the substantial entirety of the constitution by the deletion or alteration of numerous existing provisions the court examines only the number of provisions affected and does not consider the degree of the change number two quality qualitative test it requires into the qualitative effects it inquires into the qualitative effects of the proposed change in the constitution the main inquiry is whether the change will accomplish such far-reaching changes in the nature of our basic governmental plan as to amount to a revision, whether there is an alteration in the structure of the government, whether there is an alteration in the structure of government is a proper subject of inquiry. Lambino versus Comilet. Again, the two-part 
test which must be satisfied by a people's initiative or number one qualitative test and number two quantitative test quantitative test and qualitative test so etong qualitative test test it asks whether the proposed change is so extensive in its provision as to change directly the substantial entirety of the constitution by the deletion or alteration of numerous existing provisions. Whereas etong qualitative test, it inquires into the qualitative effects of the proposed change in the constitution. The main inquiry is whether the change will accomplish such far-reaching changes in the nature of our basic governmental plan as to amount to a revision. So this is the two-part test which must be satisfied by people's initiative. In this way, uh, we'll be able to determine whether a proposed amendment is within the power of the people to directly propose through initiative. Letter B, the Philippines as a state. The elements, elements of the state. Number one, people, the population living in a state. Number two, territory, includes the land, the rivers, the sea, and the airspace, which the jurisdiction of the state extends. Number three, the government, the agency through which the will of the state is formulated, expressed, and carried out. Number four, sovereignty or independence, the power to command and enforce obedience free from foreign free from foreign control. So these are the four elements of the state. The four elements of the state, other version says that the four elements of the state are people, territory, government, and capacity to enter into relations with other states. Um, what are the elements of the state of a state from the perspective of international law? Answer the elements of a state are number one, permanent population, number two, defined territory, number three, government, and number four, capacity to enter into relations with other states. Question. Explain the principle of self-determination in relation to statehood. Self-determination is the right to independence for the people of non-self-governing territories and people subject to alien subjugation, domination, and exploitation, accordance with international law of unilateral declaration of independence in respect of Kosovo. So again, self-determination is the right to independence for the people of non-self-governing territories and people subject to alien subjugation, domination, and exploitation. What are the two questions? What are the two types of self-determination? The two types of self-determination are number one, internal self-determination, and number two, external self de determination internal self determination kining no, the number 1 etong number 1 is means a people's pursuit of its political economic social and cultural development within the framework of an existing state whereas number 2 external self determination is the establishment of a sovereign and independent state, the free association or integration with an independent state, or the emergence into any other political status freely determined by a people, constitute modes of implementing the right of self-determination by that people. By that people. So again, the two types of self-determination are number one, internal self-determination and external self-determination. So to, dis to distinguish these two, internal self-determination are people's pursuit of its political, economic, social, and cultural development 
within the framework of an existing state, whereas external self-determination is the establishment of a sovereign and independent state, the free association or integration with an independent state, or the emergence into any other political status freely determined by a people constitute modes of implementing the right of self-determination by that people. So first, let us understand the term self-determination. Self-determination, again, is the right to independence for the people of non-self-governing territories and people subject to alien subjugation, domination, and exploitation. So these people that are under or that are subject to alien subjugation, domination, and exploitation have this so-called self right to self-determination, uh, which is the right to independence for the people of non-self-governing territories. And etong right to self-determination, right of self-determination has two types, namely internal self-determination, which is a people's pursuit of its political, economic, social, and cultural development within the framework of an existing state. Whereas etong external self-determination is the establishment of a sovereign and independent state, the free association or integration with an independent state, or the emergence into any other political status freely determined by a people constitute modes of implementing the right of self-determination by that people. So... Um, Contemporary notions of self-determination usually distinguish between internal and external self-determination, suggesting that self-determination exists on a spectrum. Internal self-determination may refer to various political and social rights. By contrast, external self-determination refers to full legal independence, secession for the given people, from the larger political legal state. Example, independence of Kosovo from Serbia. The next concept is the fundamental powers of the state, namely police power, eminent domain, and taxation, which is a constitutional exemption principles. Uh, most importantly, the constitutional exemption principles uh, constitutional exemption from taxation principles. What are the inherent powers of the state? The inherent powers of the state are police power, the power of imminent domain, and the power of taxation. They are considered inherent because they are incidents of sovereignty and do not depend on the law or the constitution to be recognized or enforced. It does not depend in the law on the law or on or the constitution to be recognized or enforced that's why it is incident it is inherent because that's why it is called inherent powers of the state concept application and then question what is the nature and basis of police power police power is the most essential consistent and illimitable power of the state which enables it to prohibit hurtful things to the comfort, safety, and welfare of the society. Lozano v. Martinez, December 1986. It has been described as the least limitable of the inherent powers of the state. It is based on the ancient doctrine, Salos Populi Est Suprema Lex. The welfare of the people is the supreme law. So, ang kini, etong, um, etong police power is based on the ancient doctrine which states salos populi est suprema lex which is the welfare of the people is the supreme law lem lim versus packing january 1995 
What is the nature and basis of the power of eminent domain? So the right of eminent domain is usually understood to be an ultimate right of sovereign power to appropriate any property within its territory, sovereignty for public purpose. Jesus is Lord Christian School Foundation Incorporation versus Municipality of Pasig, Metro Manila, August 2005. So it is based on the necessity of the property for public use. So again, itong power of eminent domain is based on the necessity of the property for public use. Question. What is the nature and basis of the power of the state to tax? So the power to tax is inherent in the state in order to raise revenue to defray the expenses of the government or for any public purpose. So taxes are imposed for the support of the government in return for the general advantage and protection which the government affords to taxpayers and their property. So taxes are the lifeblood of the government. Requisites for its valid exercise. Question. What are the requisites for the valid exercise of police power? Answer. The requisites for the lawful exercise of police power are lawful subject and lawful means. Lawful subject means that the power will be exercised to promote the interest of the public in general as distinguished from those of a particular class. Lawful means mandates that the means employed are reasonably necessary for the accomplishment of the purpose and not unduly oppressive on individuals. Planters Products Incorporation versus Fertifield Corporation, March 2004. What are the requisites? Question. What are the requisites for the valid exercise of the power of eminent domain? Answer. The requisites for the valid exercise of the power of eminent domain are the following. Number one, necessity that is of public character. Number two, the subject of the exercise must be private property except money and choices in action. Number three, there must be a taking of private property by the government, whether actual or constructive. Number four, the taking must be for public use. Number five, the owner of the private property must be paid just compensation for the property taken. Number six, due process must be observed in the taking of the property. So again, these are the requisites for the valid exercise of police power. The requisites for the lawful exercise of police power are lawful subject and lawful means. Lawful subject means that the power will be exercised to promote the interests of the public in general as distinguished from those of a particular class. Lawful means mandates that the means employed are reasonably necessary for the accomplishment of the purpose and not unduly oppressive on individuals. On the other hand, the requisites for the valid exercise of the power of eminent domain are number one, necessity that is of public character. Number two, the subject of the exercise must be private property except mon money money and choices in action number three there must be a taking of the private property by the government whether actual or constructive number four the taking must be for public use number five the owner of the private property must be paid just compensation for the property taken number six due process must be observed in the taking of the property question can the public character or of the necessity for the taking be questioned before the courts. It depends. If the discretion is exercised by Congress, it is a political question. However, if it is only delegated power, we must distinguish between the grant of special authority and grant of general authority. If it is a grant of specific authority, it is not a justiciable question. If it is a grant of general authority, 
it is a justiciable question that may be addressed to the courts. So, City of Manila versus Chinese Community of Manila, October 1919. The necessity within the rule that a particular property to be expropriated must be necessary does not mean an absolute but only a reasonable or practical necessity such as would combine the greatest benefit to the public with the least inconvenience and expenses to the condemning condemning power party and the property owner considered with such benefit. City of Manila versus Arellano Law Colleges. So again, question, can the public character of the necessity for the taking be questioned before the courts? Public char character of the necessity for the taking be questioned. Can it be questioned before the courts? It depends. If the discretion is exercised by Congress, if the Congress, so meaning if the Congress is the one exercising uh, the power of eminent domain, then it is a political question however if it is only delegated power we must distinguish between the grant of a special authority and grant of a general authority so if the power is delegated then it must be distinguished we must distinguish whether it is a grant of special authority and grant of general authority if it is a grant of a specific authority then it is not a justiciable question while if it is a grant of general authority then it is a justiciable question that may be addressed to the courts so this is city of manila versus chinese community of manila october 1919 what are the requisites question what are the requisites for the actual taking of property for purposes of exercising the power of eminent domain so the requisites for the actual taking of property in exercising the power of eminent domain number one expropriation must be must enter a private property expropriator must enter a private property number two the entry must not be for a momentary period only number three entry must be under a warrant or a color of authority number four Property must be devoted to public use or otherwise informally appropriated or injuriously affected. And number five, utilization of the property must be in such a way as to oust the owner and deprive him of beneficial enjoyment of the property. This is Republic versus Viuda de Castilve, August 1974. So, atong, so let us um, recap. To recap, the requisites for the actual taking of property for the purpose of exercising the power of imminent domain. Number one, the expropriator must enter a private property. Private property. Number two, entry must not be for a momentary period. Entry must not be for a momentary period. Number three, Entry must be under a warrant or color of authority. Entry must be under a warrant or color of authority. Number four, property must be devoted to public use or otherwise formally appropriated or injuriously affected. Property must be devoted to public use or otherwise informally appropriated or injuriously affected. So the property... It must be devoted to public use or otherwise informally appropriated or injuriously affected. Number five, utilization of the property must be in such a way to oust the owner and deprive him of the beneficial enjoyment of the property. Republic versus Viuda de Castilve, August 1974. Question. What is the manner of constructive taking of property for purposes of exercising the power of eminent domain? Answer, compensable taking includes destruction, restriction, diminution, or interruption of the rights of ownership or of the common and necessary use and enjoyment of the property 
in a lawful manner, lessening or destroying its values. It is neither necessary that the owner be wholly deprived of the use of his property, nor material, whether the property is removed from the possession of the owner or in any respect changes hands. National Power Corporation versus Heirs of Makabangkit, Sangkai, August 2011. So the manner of constructive taking of property for purposes of exercising the power of eminent domain. So what is the manner of constructive taking of property for purposes of exercising the power of eminent domain? So answer compensable taking includes compensable taking includes destruction, restriction, diminution or interruption of the rights of ownership or of the common and necessary use and enjoyment of the property in a lawful manner, lessening or destroying its value. It is, not, it is neither necessary that the owner be wholly deprived of the use of his property, nor material, whether the property is removed from the possession of the owner or in any respect changes hands. Question, what are the requisites for the valid exercise of the power of taxation? Power of taxation, requisites. There are no absolute requisite for the exercise of the power of taxation, but its exercise is subject to inherent and constitutional limitations. The following are the inherent limitations. Number one, situs of taxation. It can only be exercised over subjects within the Philippine territory. Number two, it must be exercised for a public purpose. Number three, the exercise of the power must recognize international committee in taxing foreign subjects. Number four, non-delegability of power. It is a power which only the Congress generally exercises except in cases of valid delegation. Number five, exemption of the government from taxation. Mactan International, Mactan Cebu International Airport Authority versus Marcos, September 1996. Again, the following are the inherent and constitutional limitations of the power of taxation. Number one, situs of taxation. It can only be exercised over subjects within the Philippines. Number two, it must be exercised for a public purpose. Number three, the exercise of the power must recognize international committee in taxing number in taxing foreign subjects. Number four, non-delegability of power. It is a power which only the Congress generally exercises except in cases of valid delegation. Number five, exemption of government taxation. Meanwhile, the constitutional limitations on the power to tax are the following. So that those were the inherent and um, the inherent limitation. So those were the inherent limitation. This one is the constitutional limitation. Number one, due process of law. Number two, equal protection of law. Number three, uniformity, equitability, and progressivity of taxation. Number four, non-impairment of contracts. Number five, non-imprisonment for non-payment of poll tax. Number six, revenue and tariff bills must originate in the House of Representatives. Number seven, non-infringement of religious freedom. Number eight, tax exemption of properties actually directly and exclusively used for religious, charitable, and educational purposes. Number nine, majority vote of all the members of Congress required in case of legislative grant of tax exemptions. Number 10, non-impairment of the Supreme Court's jurisdiction in tax cases. Number 11, tax exemption of revenues and assets of including grants, endowments, donations, or contributions to educational institutions. And number 12, supremacy of national government over local governments in taxation. So again, the constitutional limitations on the power to tax are number one, due process of law, two, equal protection of law, three, uniformity, equitability, and progressivity of taxation, four, non-impairment 
of contracts. 5. Non-imprisonment for non-payment of poll tax. 6. Revenue and tariff bills must originate in the House of Representatives. 7. Non-infringement of religious freedom. 8. Tax exemption of the properties actually directly and exclusively used for religious, charitable, and educational purposes. Number 9. Majority vote of all the members of Congress required in case of legislative grant of tax exemptions. Number 10. Non-impairment of the Supreme Court's jurisdiction in tax cases. Number 11. Tax exemption of revenues and assets of including grants, endowments, donations, or contributions to educational institutions. And number 12, supremacy of national government over local government in taxation. Similarities and differences. What are the similarities of the police power, power of imminent domain, and the power of taxation? The similarities of police power, power of imminent domain, and power of taxation are the following number one inherent in the state as a necessary attribute of sovereignty exercised even without need of express constitutional grant number two necessary and indispensable state cannot be effective without them number three enduring and indestructible as the state itself number four methods by which state interferes with private property Number five, presupposes equivalent compensation. And number six, exercised primarily by the legislature. What are the distinctions of the police power, power of imminent domain, and the power of taxation? Power of police power as to the scope. It regulates both the liberty and property. While imminent domain and taxation affects only property rights. Number two, as to exercising authority. So, police power is exercised only by the government, whereas eminent domain may be delegated to private entities, while taxation is exercised only by the government. As to purpose for the exercise of the power. So, police power, public necessity, and the right of the state and of the public to self-preservation and self-protection. Then, as to the purpose for the exercise of the power, eminent domain, necessity of the public for the use of private property, taxation, public necessity, lifeblood theory. As to the subject of the exercise of the power, police power, Property is noxious or intended for a noxious purpose and as such taken and destroyed. Whereas for imminent domain and taxation, property is wholesome and is devoted to the use, it is devoted to public use or purpose. As to compensation given to the owner of the property. So police power, compensation is the intangible altruistic feeling that the individual has contributed to the public good so there is no compensation there is no um, monetary compensation whereas imminent domain and taxation compensation is the full and fair equivalent of the property taken this is for imminent domain it is the full and fair equivalent of the property taken whereas for taxation Compensation is the protection and public improvements instituted by the government for the taxes paid. The constitutional tax exemption principles are the following. Tax exemption of properties actually directly and exclusively used for religious, charitable, and educational purposes. And number two is majority vote of all the members of Congress required in case of legislative grant of tax exemptions. Then, um, tax exemption, number three, tax exemption of revenues and assets of including grants, endowments, donations, or contributions to educational institutions. So, to expound, tax exemptions under constitutional limitations. So, tax exemption of properties for religious, charitable, and educational purposes. 
Prohibition Against Taxation of Non-Stock, Non-Profit, Educational Institutions, Non-Impairment of Contracts, Supremacy of the National Government, and Over the Local Government. So these are the limitations, constitutional limitations of uh, taxation, the power of taxation. Tax exemptions of properties for religious, charitable, and educational purposes. Section 28, Paragraph 3, Article 3 of the 1987 Constitution. Charitable institutions, churches, and parsonages, or convents appurtenant thereto, mosques, non-profit cemeteries, and all lands, buildings, and improvements actually directly and exclusively used for religious, charitable, or educational purposes shall be exempt from taxation. It covers real property taxes only. Accordingly, a conveyance of such exempt property can be subject to transfer taxes. So it covers, so this exemption covers real property taxes only. A conveyance of such exempt property can be subject to transfer taxes. So kung ibalik, if this property is will be sold, then it is subject to transfer taxes. Properties exempt under the Constitution from the payment of property taxes. Atong, to break down, let us break down. Number one, charitable institutions. Two, churches and parsonages or convents appurtenant thereto. Number three, mosques. Number four, non-profit cemeteries. Number five, all lands, buildings, and improvements. Actually, directly and exclusively used for religious, charitable, or educational purposes shall be exempt from taxation. This is Article 6, Section 28. Meaning of charitable. It is not restricted to relief of the poor or sick. The test whether an enterprise is charitable or not is whether it exists to carry out a purpose recognized in law as charitable or whether it is maintained for gain, profit, or private advantage. Long Center of the Philippines versus Quezon City, June 2004. Also, an organization must meet the substantive test of charity. Charity is essentially a gift to an indefinite number of persons, which lessens the burden of government. In other words, charitable. Institutions, in other words, charitable institutions provide for free goods and services to the public, which would otherwise fall on the shoulder of government. CIR versus St. Luke's Medical Center, September 2012. Meaning of actual, direct, and exclusive use of the property for religious, charitable, and educational purposes. It is the direct and immediate and actual application of the property itself to the purpose of to the purposes for which the charitable institution is organized. It is not the use of the income from the real property that is determinative of whether the property is used for tax-exempt purposes. Rules on exemption of properties actually exclusively and directly used for religious, educational, and charitable purposes. Coverage of constitutional provision covers real property tax only. The income of whatever kind and nature from any of their properties, real or personal, or from any of their activities, for profit, regardless of the disposition made of such income, shall be subject to tax. Requisite to avail this exemption, property must be actually, directly, and exclusively used by religious, charitable, and educational institution. Test for the grant of this exemption use of the property for such purposes, not the ownership thereof. The next um, constitutional tax exemption or prohibition against taxation of non-stock, non-profit, non-profit educational institutions. So all revenues and assets of non-stock, non-profit educational institutions used actually directly and exclusively for educational purposes shall be exempt from taxes and duties this is section 4 paragraph 3 article 9 9 article 14 of the 1987 constitution so again all revenues and assets of non-stock non-profit educational institutions used actually 
directly and exclusively for educational purposes shall be exempt from taxes and duties. Section 4, Paragraph 3, Article 14 of the 1987 Constitution. All revenues and assets of non-stock non-profit educational institutions used actually directly and exclusively for educational purposes shall be exempt from taxes and duties upon the dissolution or cessation of the corporate existence of such institution their assets shall be disposed of in the manner provided for by law proprietary educational institutions including those cooperatively owned may likewise be entitled to such exemption subject to the limitations provided by law including restrictions on dividends and provision for reinvestment first the constitutional provision refers to two kinds of educational institution non-stock non-profit educational institutions and proprietary educational institutions second um Sa kaso ni sa DLSU, De La Salle University, um, DLSU falls under the first category. Even the commissioner admits that the status of DLSU as a non-stock, non-profit educational institution. Third, while DLSU claim for tax exemption arises from is based on the constitution, the constitution in the same provision also imposes certain conditions to avail the exemption. We discuss below the import of the constitutional text vis-a-vis -vis the commissioner's counter-arguments. Fourth, there is a marked distinction between the treatment of non-stock, non-profit educational institution and proprietary educational institution. The tax exemption granted to a non-stock, non-profit educational institution is conditioned only on the actual, direct, and exclusive use of their revenues and assets for educational purposes. While tax exemption may also be granted to proprietary educational institutions, these exemptions may be subject to limitations imposed by Congress. Tax exemption granted by Constitution to non-stock, non-profit educational institution is conditioned only on the actual, direct, and exclusive use of their assets, revenues, and income for educational purposes. Next concept, relevance of declaration of principles in state policies. Question, what is the nature of the Philippines of the Philippine state? The Philippines is a democratic and republican state. Sovereignty resides in the people and all government authority emanates from them. It is, number one, democratic as it is a participatory democracy and contemplates instances where the people would act directly and not through their representatives. Number two, it is republican as it is a representative government, a government run by the people and for the people its essence is representation and renovation question what is the foreign policy of the philippines the state shall pursue an independent foreign policy in its relations with other states the paramount considerate consideration shall be national sovereignty territory integrity territorial integrity national interest and the right of self-determination the right to self-determination question may the philippines declare war no the philippines renounces war as an instrument of national policy adopts the generally accepted principles of international law as part of the law of the land and adheres to the policy of peace equality justice freedom cooperation and amity with all nations the law authorizes a declaration not a declaration not of war but only to the existence of a state of war the law authorizes a declaration not of war but only of the existence of a state of war it suggests 
a war already begun or provoked by the enemy and the existence of which we are only affirming. Question. Discuss the methods of adoption of general principles of international laws into the local laws of the Philippines. Answer. There are two methods of making general principles of international laws part of the law, local laws of the Philippines. Number one, doctrine of incorporation. By virtue of this doctrine, the courts have applied the rules of international law in a number of cases, even if such rules had not previously been subject to statutory enactments, because these generally accepted principles of international law are automatically part of our own laws. Coroda v. Halandoni, March 1949. We adhere to this principle by virtue of Section 2, Article 2 of the 1987 Constitution. Number two, doctrine of transformation. The transformation method requires that an international law be transformed into a domestic law through a constitutional mechanism such as a local legislation. Question, what is civilian supremacy and what is its basis? Civilian supremacy means that the sovereign Filipino people is supreme. Civilian authority is at all times supreme over the military. The armed forces of the Philippines is the protector of the people and the state. Its goal is to secure the sovereignty of the state and the integrity of the national territory, as sovereignty resides in the people and all government authority emanates from them. And this supremacy is at all times supreme over the military. Question. Are members of the armed forces of the Philippines triable by regular courts? Yes. Question. Are the members of the armed forces of the Philippines triable by regular courts? Yes. Section 1, RA 907055 lays down the general rule that members of the AFP and other persons subject to military law, including members of the citizens, Armed Forces Geographical Units, CAFGU, who commit crimes or offenses penalized under the revised penal code, like Kudita and other special penal laws or local ordinances, shall be tried by the proper civil court. The exception is where the civil court, before arraignment, has determined the offense to be service-connected. Then the offending soldier shall be tried by a court-martial. The exception to the exception is where the President of the Philippines, in the interest of justice, directs before arraignment that any such crimes or offenses be tried by the proper civil court. Gonzalez v. Abaya, August 2006. What is the role of the armed forces of the Philippines? The armed forces of the Philippines is the protector of the people and the state. Its goal is to secure the sovereignty of the state and the integrity of the national territory. Section 3, Article 2 of the Constitution. Question. What is the prime duty of the government? The prime duty of the government is to serve and protect the people. The government may call upon the people to defend the state, and in the fulfillment thereof, all citizens may be required under conditions provided by law to render personal, military, or civil service. The duty of the government to defend the state cannot be performed except through an army to leave the organization of an army to the will of the citizens would be to make this duty of the government excusable should there be no sufficient men who would volunteer to enlist therein. People versus Dagman, July 19, 1938. Discuss the doctrine of separation of church and state and its consequences. The separation of church and state shall be inviolable. Article 2, Section 6 of the Constitution. Under our constitutional scheme, it is not the task of the state to favor any religion by protecting it against an attack by any other religion, by another religion. Vis-a-vis -vis religious differences, the state enjoys no banquet of options. Iglesia Ni Cristo versus Court of Appeals. Question. What is non-establishment clause? The non-establishment clause means that the state cannot set up a church nor pass laws which aid one religion, aid all, all religion, or prefer one religion over another, nor force nor influence a person to go to or remain away from the, real, from the church against his will or force him to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. Everson v. Board of Education, February, February 1947. 
Let's discuss the state's independent foreign policy and freedom from nuclear weapons. The constitutional policy of a self-reliant and independent national economy does not necessarily rule out the entry of foreign investments, goods, and services. It contemplates neither economic seclusion nor mendicancy in the international community. Tanyada v. Sangara, May 1997. However, there is a marked antipathy in the Constitution towards foreign military presence in the country or of foreign influence in general. Moreover, the Philippines, consistent with national interests, adopts and pursues a policy of freedom from nuclear weapons in its territory. Article 2, Section 8 of the Constitution. Question. What is the policy of the state on human rights? The state values the dignity of every human person and guarantees full respect for human rights. As the government is the chief guarantor of order and security, that constitutional guarantee of the right to life, liberty, and security of person is rendered ineffective if the government does not afford protection to these rights, especially when they are under threat. Question. Is the right of the people to a balanced and healthful ecology self-executing and a basis for a cause of action? Generally, the provision of Article 2 of the 1987 Constitution do not confer rights as they are merely declaration of principles and policies. However, the right to a balanced and healthful ecology enunciated in Article 2, Section 16 gives rise to a cause of action that may be enforced by any citizen. Oposa versus Factoran, July 1993. Question. What is the policy of the state on local autonomy? The state shall ensure the autonomy of local governments. The territorial political subdivision shall enjoy the territorial and political subdivision shall enjoy local autonomy. The above quoted provision of the Constitution and the LGC Local Government Code reveal the policy of the state to empower local government units to develop and ultimately become self-sustaining and effective contributors to national economy. Belhika v. Ochoa, November 2013 What is the policy of the state on public service? The state shall guarantee equal access to opportunities for public service and prohibit political dynasties as may be defined by law. This provision does not contain a judicially enforceable constitutional right and merely specifies a guideline for legislative action. It is not intended to compel the state to enact positive measures that would accommodate as many as possible into public office. The privilege may be subjected to limitations such as the provision of the omnibus election code or new ones candidates. Question. What is the policy? of the state on disclosure of matters of public interest. Subject to reasonable conditions prescribed by law, the state adopts and implements a policy of full public disclosure of all its transactions involving public interest. So Article 2, Section 28 of the Constitution recognizes the duty of officials, officials to give information even if nobody demands, this provision is essential to hold public officials accountable to the people. The absence of an implementing legislation is not an excuse in not affecting such policy. This is self-executing provision. The next concept is dynamics among the branches of the government. Separation of powers. Discuss question. Discuss the separation of powers. The principle of separation of powers refers to the constitutional demarcation of the three fundamental powers of the government. Discuss the separation of powers. The principle of separation of powers refers to the constitutional demarcation of the three fundamental powers of government. To the legislative branch of the government, through Congress, belongs the power to make laws. To the executive branch of government, through the president, belongs the power to enforce laws and to the judicial branch of the government through the court belongs the power to interpret laws. Because the three great powers have been by constitutional design ordained in this respect, each department of the government has exclusive cognizance of matters within its jurisdiction and is supreme within its own sphere.
Belhika v. Ochoa, November 2013. The principle of separation of powers refers to the constitutional demarcation of the three fundamental powers of the government. To the legislative branch of the government through Congress belongs the power to make laws. The executive branch of government through the president belongs the power to enforce laws. And to the judicial branch of government through the court belongs the power to interpret laws. Question. What is the purpose of separation of powers? The separation of powers seeks to prevent the concentration of authority in one person or group of persons that might lead to irreparable error or abuse in its exercise to the detriment of republican institutions. And what is the principle of blending of powers? This is the instance when powers are not confined exclusively within one department but are assigned to or shared by several departments. It is often necessary for certain powers to be reposed in, in more than one department so that they may better collaborate with and in the process check each other for the public good. The concept is the system of checks and balance. Checks and balance. Question. What is the principle of checks and balance? This principle allows one department to resist encroachments upon its prerogative or to rectify mistakes or excesses committed by the other departments. Checks and balance is the prin this principle allows one department to resist encroachments upon its prerogatives or to rectify mistakes or excesses committed by the other departments. Next concept, delegation of powers. What is the rule on delegation of powers? The general rule is potestas delegata non delegari potest. Power delegated cannot be further be delegated. Potestas delegata non delegari potest. Power delegated cannot be cannot further be delegated. This is based on the ethical principles that delegated power constitutes not only a right but a duty to be performed by the delegate through the instrumentality of his own judgment and not through the intervening mind of another. Question. When is delegation of powers permissible? There is permissible delegation in the following cases. Number one, delegation to the people at large. Examples. A. System of initiative and referendum under Article 6 section 23 of the 1987 constitution letter b requirement of plebiscite in the creation division merger and abolition of local government units this is article 10 section 10 of the constitution letter c the initiative and referendum act which is ra 6735 then number two Another instance where there is permissible delegation of powers is number two, emergency powers of the president, article 6, section 23, paragraph 2 of the 1987 constitution, number three, tariff powers of the president, article 6, section 28, paragraph 2 of the 1987 constitution, number four, delegation to administrative bodies power of subordinate legislation and number five delegation to local government units when is delegation of powers permissible there is permissible delegation in the following cases number one delegation to the people at large examples system of initiative and referendum number two uh, requirement of plebiscite in the creation, division, merger, and abolition of local government units. And number three, initiative and referendum. So these are delegation to the people at large via the constitution and the law. The, number, the second allowable permissible delegation is emergency powers of the president under under the constitution and number three tariff powers of the president also under the constitution number four delegation to administrative bodies or subordinate power of subordinate legislation and number five delegation to the local government units question 
what are the tests for valid delegation? The test for valid delegation are number one, completeness test. The law is complete when it sets forth therein the policy to be executed, carried out, or implemented by the delegate. And number two, sufficient standard test. To be sufficient, the standard must specify, must specify the limits of the delegate's authority, announce the legislative policy and identity, and identify the conditions under which it is to be implemented. Abakada Guru Partilis versus Purisima, August 2008. The next concept is state immunity. The concept of state immunity. Question. Discuss the principle of state immunity. The state may not be sued without its consent. The, ration the rationale behind this is that there can be no legal right against the authority which makes the law on which the right depends. The state may not be sued without its consent. This is Article 16, Section 3 of the Constitution. The rationale behind this is that there can be no legal right against the authority which makes the law on which the right depends. Question. May this principle be invoked by other states? Yes. Immunity is enjoyed by other states. Consonant with the public international law principle, par in parem non habet imperium, Latin for equals have no sovereignty over each other. Par in parem non habet imperium, the head of state, who is deemed the personification of the state, is inviolable and thus enjoys immunity from suit. Question. What determines if the suit is against the state? If the enforcement of the decision rendered against a public office or agency impleted will require an affirmative act from the state, example, the appropriation of necessary amount to cover the damages awarded, then it is a suit against the state. Question. May there be a waiver of state immunity? Yes. The Constitution provides that the state may not be sued without its consent, Article 16, Section 3 of the Constitution. In order that suit may lie against the state, there must be consent, either expressed or implied. Republic versus Feliciano, March 1987. Question. How may the state give its express consent to be sued? The state may expressly give its consent to be sued when there is a law expressly granting authority to sue the state or any of its agencies. Republic versus Feliciano. It may be manifested either through a general law or a special law. Question. How may the state give its implied consent to be sued? Implied. The state may impliedly give its consent to be sued. Number one, when the state enters into a private contract unless the contract is only incidental to the performance of a government function. Santos versus Santos, November 1952. This involves Jore Gistiones, Jore Gistiones, or Private Commercial and Proprietary Acts. Jore, Jore Gestiones, Jore Gestiones, Jore Gestiones, or Private Commercial and Proprietary Acts. Jore, J U R E Gestiones, G E S T I O N I S. Jore gestiones or private commercial and proprietary acts. Number two, when the state enters into an operation that is essentially business operation, unless the business operation is only incidental to the performance of a governmental function, as for instance, arastre service, Mobile Philippines versus Customs Arastre Service, December 1966. Number three, when the state sues a private party unless the suit is entered into only to resist a claim. Lim versus Brunel, March 20, 1960. So in these instances, there is an implied consent. The state gives its implied consent to be sued. For the express consent, 
um, the state may expressly give its consent to be sued when there is a law expressly granting authority to sue the state or any of its agencies. So express consent is given when there is a law while implied consent may be given in three ways, when the state enters into a private contract. Number two, when the state inter enters into an operation that is essentially business operation, unless the business operation is only incidental to the performance of a government function. Number three, when the state sues a private party. Question, what is the scope of the consent that may be given by the state? Where the state gives its consent to be sued by private parties, either by general or special law, it may limit the action only up to the completion proceeding of proceedings anterior to the stage of execution, and that the power of courts... What is the scope of the consent that may be given by the state? Where the state gives its consent to be sued by private parties, by either general or special law, it may limit the action only up to the completion of proceedings anterior to the stage of execution and that the power of courts ends when the judgment is rendered since the government funds and properties may not be seized under writs of execution or garnishment to satisfy such judgments. Disbursements of public funds must be covered by the corresponding appropriation as required by law. Republic v. Villasor, November 1972. So what is the scope question? Again, what is the scope of the consent that may be given by the state? Where the state gives its consent, pag nagbigay ng consent yung state to be sued by private parties, either by general or special law, it may limit the action only up to the completion of proceedings anterior to the stage of execution, and that the power of courts ends when the judgment is rendered, since the government funds and properties may not be seized under writs of execution or garnishment to satisfy judgments. So still, the government funds and properties may not be, seized, may not be seized under writs of execution or garnishment to satisfy such judgment. So, um, hanggang ano na lang siya? Hanggang... Uh, completion hanggang the power of the courts ends when the judgment is rendered and the power of the court ends when judgment is rendered since government funds and properties may not be seized under writs of execution or garnishment to satisfy such judgment Disbursement of public funds must be covered by corresponding appropriation as required by law. Question. What is there an exception to the rule on prohibition of garnishment of public funds? Yes. If the funds belong to a public corporation or a government-owned or controlled corporation, which is clothed with a personality of its own, separate and distinct from that of the government, then its funds are not exempt from garnishment. From garnishment, this is so because when the government enters into con into commercial business, it abandons its sovereign capacity and is to be treated like any other corporation. National Housing Authority versus heirs of Isidro Guevelondo, June 2003. So before execution may proceed. A claim for payment of the judgment award must first be filed by the Commission on Audit, which has the primary jurisdiction to examine, audit, and settle all debts and claims of any sort due from or owning the government or any of its subdivisions, agencies, and instrumentalities, including GOCCs. AGRA versus Commission on Audit. Question. UP entered into an agre agreement with Stern Builders for the construction of buildings in its campus. Out of the three buildings submitted by Stern, UP failed to pay the third, prompting Stern to sue and collect unpaid billing and to recover damages. The regional trial court ruled in favor of Stern. Subsequently, it directed the garnishment of public funds amounting to 16 million pesos belonging to UP to satisfy the writ of execution issued to enforce the already final and executory judgment against UP. 
On appeal, the order was affirmed by the Court of Appeals holding that the funds have already been earmarked for the construction project, thus dispensing without the need of further appropriation. Decide. The Court of Appeals answer the Court of Appeals erred in upholding the RTC and appropriation by Congress is required before the judgment rendering UP liable damages would be satisfied, considering that such monetary liabilities were not covered by the appropriations earmarked for said project. The Constitution strictly mandates that no money shall be paid out of the Treasury except in pursuance of an appropriation made by law. Again, the Constitution strictly mandates that no money shall be paid out of the Treasury except in pursuance of an appropriation made by law. Question. The Republic of Losovo was seeking to sell in the Philippines its well-known textiles. It entered into an agreement with a Filipino Juan de la Cruz for the latter to lease his land for the building of stores. However, the Republic of Losovo reneged on its duty and instead built its stores on the land of Captain Santos for a lower rental. Aggrieved, Juan de la Cruz sued the Republic of Losovo before the Regional Trial Court of Manila for breach of contract. The latter posed the defense of state immunity. Will the case prosper? Yes, the case of Juan de la Cruz will prosper following the doctrine espoused in the U.S. case of U.S. v. Ruiz. December 1966. Acts that are private, commercial, and proprietary in nature, jore gestiones, constitute an implied waiver of the party state of its immunity from suit. Here, the defense of state immunity by the Republic of Losovo is unavailing because it, in effect, waived such immunity by entering into a commercial and private contract with Juan de la Cruz. Concept the National Territory. What are included the national territory? Question. What are included in the national territory of the Philippines? Answer. The national territory of the Philippines includes the following. Number one, the Philippine archipelago with all the islands and waters embraced therein. Number two, all other territories over which the Philippines has sovereignty or jurisdiction consisting of its terrestrial, fluvial, and aerial domains. Number three, its territorial sea, the seabed, the subsoil, the insular shelves, and other submarine areas. And number four, the waters around, between, and connecting the islands of the archipelago, regardless of their breadth and dimensions, which form part of the internal waters of the Philippines. So what are included in the national territory of the Philippines? The national territory of the Philippines includes the following number one. Philippine archipelago with all the islands and waters embraced therein. Number two, all other territories over which the Philippines has sovereignty or jurisdiction consisting of its terrestrial, fluvial, and aerial domains. Number three, its territorial sea, the seabed, the subsoil, the insular shelves, and other submarine areas. And number four, the waters around, between, and connecting the islands of the archipelago regardless of their breadth and dimensions, which form part of the internal waters of the Philippines. Article 1 of the 1987 Constitution Question. By dropping the phrase belonging to the Philippines by historic right or legal title, did the Constitution in effect drop the Philippine claim to Sabah? Answer. No. The clause neither claims nor disclaims Saba. It has, however, avoided the use of language historically offensive to Malaysia and has used instead the clause over which the Philippines has sovereignty or jurisdiction. Archipelagic Doctrine Question. What is the archipelagic doctrine? Answer. The waters around, between, and connecting the islands of the archipelago, regardless of their breadth and dimensions, form part of the internal waters of the Philippines. Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution. Under the doctrine, the Philippine archipelago is considered as one integrated unit instead of being divided into more than 7,000 7, islands. This assertion, together with the application of the straight baseline method, is what is referred to as the archipelagic doctrine. By using this method, the outermost, our outermost points of our archipelago are connected with straight baselines, and all waters inside the baselines are considered as 
internal waters. Again, what is archipelagic doctrine? The waters around, between, and connecting the islands of the archipelago, regardless of their breadth and dimensions, form part of the internal waters of the Philippines. Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution.